The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Destiny is a journey. And what I learned from Bob Mumford once when we were up in, uh, we were doing a seminar to all Elam pastors at West Point, you know, the military academy. And, and uh, Bob Mumford shared something that I thought was significant. He said, destiny always includes people, other people. Destiny always includes success. You can actually reach what the world would call success without fulfilling your destiny. And even without people. There are people who are successful because they walked on people. That's not destiny. Destiny means that if you would treat everyone as if you were entertaining an angel, recognize that there's divine appointments among good people and bad people, that God is orchestrating a plan for your life, and that if you respond properly, you'll be in the right place at the right time. Wouldn't you like to be in the right place at the right time? Yeah. So here's the principle. And before we even get there, Psalm 34, verse 19. Periodically, I'm going to have you repeat it back to me during the message. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. My emphasis is on the latter part. You can get all bummed out on the first part, couldn't you? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them all. Now, here's where I want to start. Luke chapter 24. Uh, in Luke 24, it's a story about uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You familiar with that? And while they were conversing and reasoning, what is all these things that have transpired recently? Jesus drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And so they did not know him. And when they drew near to a village where they were going, he indicated that he was going to go on further. I love that part. He's just going to, well, I'll just keep on going. Nobody invites me to be around. And they, they constrained him saying, oh, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass. I don't know, anytime you're in your Bible it says, now it came to pass, pay attention. Now it came to pass that as they sat with the table with them, that he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. And that's when their eyes were opened. And I'm totally convinced for people to find their purpose, their dream, their vision, that in the journey that same pattern will happen to you and I. I've seen it happen. And I've seen it to where we fail to understand that that was the pattern and the principle. So you, we, we would be one step ahead and save ourselves a lot of unnecessary trials and tribulations if we would understand that that pattern remains for everyone, no exception. Took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, and gave the bread, and their eyes were opened. And I began to uh, use this in conjunction with Let's just take David first as an example. If you use that pattern and that principle, he took David from where? The sheepfolds. He took David from the sheepfolds. He sent Samuel as an act of God to go and find him and anoint him. He blessed him amongst his brothers. They probably didn't even know what was going on here. All they know is here comes Samuel, and he's showing up and he wants to see Jesse's sons, and then he turns around and anoints David. So he took David from the sheepfolds, 
where there was education in the process. Don't think that these are just mundane jobs. Je if Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered, how much more did David learn even shepherding from tending sheep? Didn't he have experience with the lion and the bear? He learned that before he was king, right? So the principle remains the same. God will take you and then he will bless you. He'll put an anointing on your life. He'll put purpose in you. For he, before the foundation of the earth, he put a purpose in you for there to be God works that you would someday walk in them. Did he not? He didn't make anybody say, oh, and then I'm going to make a couple dozen people with no purpose at all and just take up space. You know, he's not going to do that. But the interesting thing is, is that he was anointed. Uh, those of you that uh, know the life of David know that he, there was three anointings in his life, and they were progressive, the three anointings of David. The first one was with Samuel, and that was amongst his brethren, and they are probably kind of clueless at that moment. Why is Samuel anointing by the direction of God, youngest, David? But later he was amongst Judah. There was a second anointing where amongst his peers he had proven himself on this journey to destiny and was anointed there. And finally, the crowning anointing was he was anointed with, uh, there was a divided Israel at that time, but a united Israel, he was anointed over all of Israel. So there was clearly greater increases in jurisdiction and authority. And if we jump way ahead to the book of Acts, it basically says, David served the purposes of God for his generation. I don't believe that's just for David. I believe that's for you and I. To serve the purposes of God for your generation. You want to be fulfilled. You want to enjoy what you do and who you are. You've got to find and tap into the dreams, the purposes. I'm, uh, I'm just a little cautious with people's dreams and purpose and vision and go after it and go get it because a lot of times it's not exactly accurate and they have difficulty with that. But I believe that if you stuck to this principle and that God will take you, he will bless you, but then he's going to do something else. He's going to break you. That's out of all the selfishness that needs to go for you to come into the purposes of God. Because if it's the purposes of God, it's not your purposes. So he's going to take you and then he blesses you, but then he breaks you. And I look at David. We, we know of his accomplishments. We know that, what an epitaph. I even like his epitaph. I think in Samuel where it says, uh, the son of Jesse, a sweet psalmist of Israel, a man exalted by God. That was his own evaluation of himself. Gee, he didn't say king, warrior, did he? He said, I'm just a son of Jesse. I knew where I come from. I know where my roots are, that I'm just a son of Jesse, but I'm a man that was exalted on high by God. I'm the sweet psalmist of Israel. Isn't that beautiful? That was, that was self-evaluation that was healthy. I'm a worshiper is what he's saying. At heart, that's what I am. I'm a worshiper. He didn't mention king and warrior, all of the things that were quite accomplished in his life. Nevertheless, that's not the way he viewed himself. He viewed himself in a much healthier perspective. It wasn't in position and title. He took David from the sheepfolds, 2 Samuel 7. He blessed him, 1 Samuel 16. He broke him. Matter of fact, Jennifer and I just went with Sid Roth to uh, Israel, and all of the all of his guests that have been on his program uh, spoke at a different place in Israel. And I thought it was really neat because we spoke exactly where I would have wanted to speak. We spoke at the En Gedi Desert. And you look out into the desert and you see this is the place where God did his finest work on David. For 17 years he ran from Saul. That's where you make the man. So he took David, he blessed him and anointed him. What, that anointing, by the way, is potential. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought I could just start out. I've, I've known people that are doing nothing for preparation, and they're 
all of a sudden believing their ministry is just going to fall out of the sky. You know, I don't have to read my Bible, I don't have to pray, and I don't have to do any preparation. If God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. And I think you will, probably won't enter into it. But he broke him, running from Saul for 17 years. And when we were in that Engedi desert, it, it really added to that story. You know, you looked around and went, wow, 17 years, you're in these rocks? That must have been fun. Huh? 17 years. But ultimately, God gave him to Judah and all of Israel, 2 Samuel chapter 5. And he fulfilled the purposes of God for his generation. Did he make mistakes? Yes. Oh, a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. The point is, is he, he never stopped being a worshiper for God. He never stopped pursuing that I'm the son of Jesse, a man that's been exalted by God, the sweet psalmist of Israel. That was his epitaph in his own words. That's what he would have wanted on his tombstone in advance, in older age. That was the way he viewed his life. That's the way we should be viewing our life. Let's look at the life of Joseph, see if the pattern holds true. He took Joseph from among his brothers and gave him a dream. Oh, so Joseph had a vision. Joseph had a dream. And what was the next thing that happened to him? We know that God blessed him with dream interpretation. He gave him a dream and he gave him the gift to interpret, right? We know the story later on. So he blessed him. But before he blessed him, there was thrown in the pit by his brothers. Uh-oh. So he took him. He blessed him. And then he broke him. I think we resist the breaking part in our life. We waste our sorrows. When in reality, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But what? God delivers you out of them all. If you respond properly. If you respond properly. God will take you by this is worth writing down. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. You can go the hard way. You can go the easy way. But God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to. You can go around the same old mountain until you get it right. Or you can literally humble yourself and say, God, thy will, not my will. I'm ready to release into your loving hands. Because that kind of brokenness is basically a surrender to God. And I know God broke him in the pit when his brothers threw him there, but then what else happened later? It goes to prison. Oh, this is great. He goes from the pit with his brothers to prison. Some people say there must be a curse on his life. And you know what? You can respond with, it's everybody else doing something to me. Or you can respond, instead of, why, God, is this happening? Listen to me, Christians, because you do this. I minister to this all the time. And I mean all the time. I'm talking seasoned Christians. I'm talking pastors. I've ministered to this. Why is this happening? And I'm saying you're asking the wrong question. The real man and woman of God, in order to make progress and see a quick turnaround, you say, how do you want me to respond? Not why is this happening? That why is this happening? If you don't get the answer, you're going to go down the tubes in depression, discouragement, disillusionment, dis, 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 anything with a dis is from the pit of hell, right? And someone recently did, uh, Christy did research on this, dis is even a, a demon god, dis. So, you know, don't put that in front of any of your words as a lifestyle, get rid of it. But look at that, it's basically the pit and prison and being falsely accused. You know how many people I've watched shipwreck when they're falsely accused? You're supposed to be saying, God, how do you want me to respond when I'm falsely accused? Instead of, why is this happening? And get into the blame game, which really accomplishes absolutely nothing. The blame game should be over. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people. And by the way, when you forgive a perpetrator, that doesn't get them off the hook. It gets the poison out of you and the prison bars around you gone. You're free, in other words. 
I, I, I mean, to me, someone that doesn't want to forgive, that just wants vengeance, it, I, I don't even understand it because they only hurt themselves. I mean, just the benefit of forgiveness. First of all, you please God. Is there anything wrong with that? When you forgive, you please God. Number two, you feel better. Is there something wrong with that? You feel better after you forgive. You're clean. Three, you basically s remove blockages to emotional growth. You have a problem with that. Would be nice if some 60-year-olds quit acting like four. <laughs> right? Oh, and you start sensing after you forgive the presence of God easier. Oh, you start to get engrafted with the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, you start bringing physical health to your physical body. Oh, I don't think I want to forgive. That's too much good stuff. I just wouldn't be able to take all that good. <laughs> I'd rather just keep, I'd rather just stay bitter and be revengeful. That feels good. And it's also destroying my physical body. And the CDC says 90% of physical ailments are emotionally based. So you want to keep all that poison in there? Go for it. That's tomorrow's diseases. So when you get them tomorrow, know that you, kept, you wanted to hang on to that vengeance. You didn't want to let go. You, didn't want, you were so afraid they were going to get off the hook. Look, they don't get off the hook. You get off the hook. And while we're on this, I'm going to throw this in. This must be for visitors, right? Or someone walking by, U-string, yeah, it's someone for U-string. Men who don't think they have emotions, stress. Stress means you're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. Do you want to be micromanaged? Do you want to live in stress? You drop 20 points in your IQ too, right? They can prove that scientifically. Can you afford 20 points drop in your IQ? <laughs> really? I can't. And I would, I would guess to say most people can't. But isn't that beautiful that God broke him in the pit and the prison, but eventually he went to the palace. I think if you respond properly in the pit and the prison, you go to the palace. We once had a person who was, in, uh, who was basically brainwashed by the modern uh, educational system. <laughs> Is that blunt? Um, you know, in other words, if people just understood, they would be better. You know, like the perfectibility of man through education. You know, if he's a crook in his heart, he'd just be a smarter crook. That's my opinion. Well, she said, she read the story of David and she said, in true school teacher fashion, liberal school teacher fashion, she said, oh, after all that he went through, a light bulb finally went on in Joseph and he realized, oh, I need to forgive. I don't believe it happened when his brother showed up. I believe that forgiveness and that heart change came through the brokenness of his life in the pit, dealing with it properly, in the prison, being falsely accused. He had that character development, attitude, and motivation developed in his heart long before he was ready for the palace. But when he was in the palace, he could still not respond with revenge, stored up emotions that were never dealt with and presented to God. You know, you were bought with the price. I don't know where we got this idea in the church that my mind and my will belongs to God, but I can suppress and stuff my feelings. If you were bought with a price, he, ha he owns all of you, mind, will, and emotions. And without emotion, you cannot have a good or a bad relationship. All relationships require emotion. And wasn't it, uh, wasn't it Jonathan Edwards that said the emotions are the gateway to knowing God? He saw during the Great Awakening people weeping and repenting, and then they were radically changed. He saw some people stoic and even during the Great Awakening, he said they weren't much changed before and they weren't much changed after. He saw to it that, you know what, people need to give wholeheartedly to the Lord. Emotions, mind, and will, all three need to be subordinate to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, he took Joseph, he blessed him with dream interpretation, he ran into the right people even in prison, didn't he? He gave 
him to save his entire family and an entire people from famine when he was in the place of power to do it. To fulfill the purposes of God for his generation, when Jacob saw that there, that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us that we might live and not die. And so Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain. Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain to those who journeyed the famine, etc., etc. And you know the rest of the story. He showed compassionate love. If you want to understand forgiveness, read chapter 50 of Genesis and listen to the forgiveness that flows from the heart of a transformed man who knew that when he was broken, he responded properly to God. Have you got the pattern now for your life? He took you. He blessed you. He broke you to distribute you for your purposes. Don't run from the breaking. It's not in, the, in this world, you will have tribulation. This shouldn't be a, a, a surprise. As a matter of fact, I've gotten to the point, and Jennifer learned this when we got married uh, close to 20 years ago. Jennifer, the first lesson she learned was when stuff started falling apart and looking bad, I'm going, something good is right around the corner. Something good, and it's always transpired that way. So the quicker you respond properly in a trial, properly in a trial, the quicker it turns around. You bellyache, get discouraged, you actually bring those things upon yourself. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but all. What's all mean in Hebrew? All, oh, right. See, my scholarship is just flowing out today. <laughs> But isn't that a beautiful thing that he did for his life? But you see that people want ministry, they want their dreams and their visions and their plans to come to pass, but you've got to understand that God has to prepare the man or woman before he prepares big ministry. Jesus himself, look at that, 30 years for three years of ministry. If God made the man, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. There was 30 years of preparation and he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He responded. He didn't react. Let's look at another person's life. Paul. Acts chapter 9. Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And then as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'd say he took him from his plans. <laughs> he fell to the ground. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Trembling and astonished, the Lord says, what do you want me to do? Anybody get saved that way? I sure did. I was making fun of a TV preacher and mocking him while I'm smoking pot. And all of a sudden, I got stone sober <laughs> instead of the other stone. And he was talking to me as if there was no other audience. Scary. God can do those things. Don't make him raise his voice, though. There's an easier way. He blessed him. What was the first thing he did after he took Paul? He got the scales to fall from his eyes. He sent him to someone and get him blessed. Hmm? He took him. He blessed him. And then he broke him. I believe there's a lot of breaking of Paul, not just in his ministry. But he even went into obscurity for a number of years in Arabia, right? Where he didn't confer with flesh and blood. He probably said, the way I need to respond to all this stuff that's happening, i got to see where this fits. <laughs> because I was teaching one way, and against this heresy of Christianity and Jesus stuff, this way, and now I'm in the way, I think I better go find out how to respond to this. He got broken. And I believe his brokenness 
was almost a, a, a constant. But then it came to the place where, in the book of Acts in one place, I believe you can read between the lines, and I don't think you're doing it any harm. But in, in Paul's life, there's a place in Acts where Jesus had to appear to him again. Because he was getting, what, shipwrecked, beat, stoned. Did, don't you think he had a little bit of trials and tribulations? God delivered him out of them all. But one night, Jesus appeared to him in a vision, and he said, Paul, do not be silent. They will not harm you. I have many people that have not, in this city, that have not bowed their knee to the enemy. If we read between the lines, you know what I think Paul was thinking, the great man of God? I'm tired of talking. Because <laughs> the first thing Jesus said to him, do not be silent. Now, you think Jesus could read your mail? Paul was probably going, every time I open my mouth, they either stone me, whip me, persecute me in some way. Do not be silent. Be not afraid. No one will harm you. I'm tired of getting beat up, stoned. Huh? Don't be afraid. Nobody's going to harm you. Isn't that beautiful? I believe when you're willing to respond the right way, God will read your mail, and then you have a chance to be either accept or reject what he's telling you. And what did, what did he took him, he blessed him, he broke him. But I always loved the way he looked at his vision. To this day, I still look at the way God gave me my vision. Galatians 1, but when it pleased God, here's a man who's understanding his destiny his dream, his purpose. He said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, and he called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. There's a purpose for you. Most people get sidetracked with what am I going to do? He's saying primarily the vision for each and every one of us is inside before it's external. It's an internal vision before it's what you're to do. It's what you to, are to become is more important than what you're to do. And many people want to jump ahead to what I do and my dream, my vision. And I'm telling you what, if you don't allow the brokenness and the proper responses and the character, the attitude, and a proper motivation, you're not capable of doing that. If he wouldn't have, if, if, if Paul would not have allowed himself to see, God, what is your purpose? I had an agenda. I was killing Christians, and I was quite successful at it. And I've got, I've got, I was, uh, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin. I came from the tribe of kings. I was a Pharisee of a Pharisees. I mean, if he wanted to sit and brag on his accomplishments, he could have, couldn't he? But I consider those things rubbish compared to the excellency of knowing Jesus as Lord. Galatians 1. I love this. But God who separated me from my mother's womb. Now here's destiny. Here's purpose. He separated me from my mother's womb and he called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. That's good for you. That's good for me. That's not just the Apostle Paul. Your first mission, your first vision, your first vision and dream should be that Jesus be formed in you. Paul labored that Christ would be formed in you. This was his passion to see changed lives. To reveal his son in me. Now look what happens after that. That I might preach. To reveal his son in me that I might preach. We jump to the preach part, but he's saying, no, no, no. I, want, I was called out of my mother's womb to reveal his son in me, then preach. Preach what is substance. Preach what you own. Don't preach what somebody else owns or what you think. You don't, the church doesn't need more information. They need more substance. They need more changed lives. They need more vision that's coming with the proper heart attitude, motive, and character, to reveal his son in me that I might preach. Now, he said, and he said, I didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood. I went for a season for years in Arabia and had to sort these things out. God, how do I respond? And then God said, basically, after the internal, listen to me closely, after the internal vision, we learn in the book of Acts later where where he's called up in front of, uh, who was that, King Agrippa? And he says, 
he's telling King Agrippa the story. I fell to the ground, and there was this voice that said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And Jesus said, rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, for this purpose, for this purpose. I know the DVD or the Ustream is not stuck, but purpose. Everybody wants to know their purpose. You have to pay attention to what God calls purpose. God's calling this purpose. I've appeared to you for this purpose. Here's your purpose. This purpose should be tied in with your vision and your dream, no matter what you're called to be and to do. This purpose is to make you a minister and a witness of both the things which you have seen and the things that I'm yet to show you. I'm calling you and telling you there's some things you haven't seen yet. I'm telling you to be a witness to the things that I did show you, but there's also some things that are coming later. And I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles with whom I now send you. So he took him, he blessed him, he broke him, and then he gave him as the apostle to the Gentiles, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. He gave him. And I'm telling you what, he's still giving today, isn't he? How many of us have been mentored by the Apostle Paul and by his writings? So he, he was given, he served the purposes of God for his generation. But it says, now here's the part we have a tendency to focus on and get the cart before the horse. It said that he was going to deliver me from the Jew and the Gentiles to whom he was now sending me to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That's the external. I did exactly that. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, his ministry. Ministry was second. Having Christ formed in him was primary. If you don't have the primary dealt with internally, your vision and dream for a changed life, you really don't have that much to offer. You have to rely on some gifts and char charisma. But ultimately, you can't give something you don't have. And God wants changed lives. So he had an internal and an external vision. You have an internal and an external vision. <laughs> this sounds kind of arrogant, but I would just want to show you it's for everybody. Now we go after we go from um, after we go from David to Joseph to Paul. Now we're going to Dennis. <laughs> All right. <laughs> He's certainly not up with those people. But the point is, you and I have the same pattern. He's going to take you, he's going to bless you, he's going to break you, and then he's going to distribute you to serve the purposes of God for your generation. He took me, making fun of Christians, <laughs> kind of like Paul, only not as bad, I wasn't killing them, just with my mouth murder. I was murdering them with my tongue. But he took me. 2 Timothy 1.11, he said, I've appointed you a preacher. He blessed me with such a mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit that even though I was still wet behind the ears and a baby Christian, I was six months old, tops, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and it was such a powerful uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, they threw me on TV, radio, full gospel businessmen, I did Women's Aglow, I did everything. And it was all on a supernatural uh, baptism that from that moment on discernment of his presence has become a constant there is a constant awareness and so a walk in the spirit is like second nature to me because what he basically taught me was that anything down here that is even remotely upsetting is coming between you and your God get rid of it so I learned without even knowing what I was doing that the forgiver lived in me and every time I felt a yucky feeling, get, Jesus would take my pain and my sorrow because it was interfering with what we were communing together. He taught me to close my eyes and when I sank into him I felt his presence and I always used the same example. I'd be enjoying him, communing him, ooh, this was so sweet. Even if he didn't speak a word to me, just feeling that he was there. Prayer was being with someone, and then all of a sudden, what would interrupt my wonderful communion with God, I would see my foreman at the factory. His face would come into my mind, and down here it would go, <laughs> <laughs> And 
the Lord so lovingly spoke and said, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And I learned right then that the Jesus in me is my forgiver, that it wasn't just a principle, it was a person. And I would yield down here and let him, and he carried away. And it was so easy that I was, to this day, I'm still very surprised at how difficult forgiveness is even in the modern day church. I think he wants to restore back the simplicity that's in Jesus. I think we made it harder than it is. Forgiveness is instant and forgiveness is easy. We've made it hard because we're sincerely trying to do it from here. It doesn't work from here no matter how sincere you are. He basically then took me with all of this mighty baptism, throw you on TV, throw you on radio. What happens next? He took me and he blessed me. What happens next? I had an antagonist for 13 years whose mission was to destroy me. And looking back, those were the best years of my life. Not pleasant by any means. But I had friends in every camp as early as the late 70s, early 80s. I had the prophetic. I had latter rain. I had faith camp. We did dancing in the church and flags and banners. In the late 70s and early 80s, that was not popular. I got attacked for having dancing in the church. I got attacked for having people that were in the faith camp, friends of mine that were in faith camp. I, I had friends in every camp, so I was the perfect target you know, the prophetic wasn't real popular in the 80s. And I got attacked for that. I got attacked for everything. But those 13 years, that antagonist basically purified what I believe and why I believed it. And in hindsight, as a young pastor, it was the best, best time that ever happened to me, if you respond properly. And one day... We were in a meeting with 200 pastors, Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, 200 pastors, and Dr. George Beninate from Pittsburgh and Dr. David Miner from Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. They didn't know me from Adam, but they just, they stood on a platform, and I had this antagonist show up uh, a few days before with two other people to confront me. You know, like take two or more witnesses, which is a misapplication of that scripture. But anyway, he took two or more to confront me. He wanted to debate me. I went to the head of the general overseer to whom he was ordained under, and they said, we can't control him. We have no power over him. But uh, <laughs> yes, we ordained him, but we can't do nothing. But they said, you debate him and you elevate him. He's never pastored. He's never done anything like that. He doesn't just call the shots on who he wants to debate. It'd be like you or I saying, I want to debate Trump. Tell Trump I want to debate him. <laughs> Tell Hillary, come on, come on down. It's, what would they say? Who are you? Yeah. Huh? If you did honor that, then you would elevate that person to a, a, a platform that they're not entitled to, nor do they have authority. Well, anyway, after 13 years, it broke in one meeting. Those two men didn't know who I was, but they said, uh, Pastor Dennis, would you stand up? And I stood up, and they said, God's been speaking, and both of them had the same word, Dathan, Abiram, and Korah came against Moses. And Korah, or Dathan, or Abiram, I forget, one means, their name means a high and lofty one, and something. another one says, a balding one, one whose relationship is growing cold, has come against you, and from this day forward, that is over. Amen. And by the way, everybody starts snickering, because my antagonist uh, in his early 20s was prematurely bald and wore a very poor toupee that everyone in the world knew it wasn't a good hairpiece. And so when those two, those two uh, prophets basically stood up there and said, Pastor Dennis, that balding one, 200 pastors from that region knew who they were talking about. He was a wannabe. He wanted to be a great cult researcher. 
And they started snickering. I got a phone call from him saying, you've got a lot of nerve mentioning my name in front of 200 pastors. <laughs> I didn't mention nobody's name. I was receiving a word. I didn't even get to talk. I just sat and cried. And they said, it's broken. And from that day forward, it was over. And he basically diminished. He's history. But that was a sovereign thing of God. However, the years that I was broken with that were the formative best years of my life. I wouldn't want to relive it, but at the same time, I had to know what I believed and why I believed it. I had to know how to respond, not react. Brokenness is a good thing if you respond properly. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. Amen. If you respond properly, you can go around the mountain forever, though, couldn't you? You can just mumble and grumble and complain. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And quite frankly, just make a lot, of, uh, a lot of dust. But when it settles, there's no change. There's no improvement. With God, He brings it about quickly. And not only that, during those 13 years, God blessed everything I put my hand to, and I enjoyed the journey. Wouldn't you like to, in your life, regardless of trials and tribulations, enjoy the journey? It should be more God than problems. If you've got more problems than God, perhaps you're not responding right. Perhaps you're still reacting. Why me? Why is this happening? I learned in the school of the Spirit, He broke, he broke my self-focus to be God-focused. During those 13 years, He taught me to be vulnerable and intimate with God. He told me, stuffing stuff doesn't work. Open your heart to God. Just the way David did in his time. He had to encourage himself. I didn't look for people to pray for me. I had to allow God to be vulnerable to him, break that shell, and make me vulnerable. He broke my independence. From the time I was nine years old, I lived in South Chicago. I would ask my dad for the money for my shoes and then stay in the car because I don't want my friends at nine to see me going into the shoe store with my dad. I was an adult, had my first job at 10. So what God had to do during this 13 years was break me of that independence. You think that's a good thing. But he was basically showing me, I'm going to teach you to be the other way around in the kingdom. You're going to be dependent on me, says the Lord. Oh, you're not used to that. You'd rather take Jesus, grab him by the hand, and tell him what you want to do. Come on, Jesus, we're going to go do this now. Then we're going to go do that. I, it even took a, a woman prophetess to come over to me and laugh over me before I got that broken. She laughed and said, yeah, God, Jesus loves your heart, but you're going to have to make some radical changes because you're taking Jesus by the hand and come on, Jesus, we're going to go do this now. Come on, Jesus. And he said, it's not going to work that way. You're going to follow him. But it was a beautiful work of God. And then he taught me that basically the only way I can ever learn to stay connected with him if I wanted to enjoy that constant flow was to live a forgiveness lifestyle. And that means unilaterally. That means I am not waiting for them to repent. I release forgiveness so that I'm not controlled by them. That I'm under the lordship of Jesus. He taught me basically that I'm going to break you from your reasoning mind because the reality of touching him spirit to spirit is going to be far superior. He broke me from really even preaching. Don't preach information that you think is clever. Preach what you lived so that you have a life message. And thus says the Spirit of the Lord to everybody in this room. God created you before the foundation of earth for a life message, not for a bunch of a head full of information because that's what he did to me. The first time he took that black x-ray screen, when I looked out, and I'm a young preacher in my 20s, and I'm looking at all these people older than me, at first, my first thought was, oh my, they're all older than me. They probably know more. And God said, took that black screen and went across them, and I saw big, big heads and itsy bitsy spirits. He said, don't worry about their heads. You preach to that spirit because I've given you substance. I've given you in the school of the spirit. I've given you things that you own. What you own, you can give. You can't give something you don't have. 
and you can't get something you're not even open to. God basically said, it's going to be a life message, and to this day we still preach the same way. And I noticed my son's carrying, carrying uh, pretty much after me. He doesn't like to teach anything that's not already real in his own life. If it's not real in your own life, you're hoping you get there someday. Jennifer is the next person. We covered Dennis. <laughs> Jennifer, he took Jennifer out of the midst of a totally unbelieving family. She pursued him when she, was, when she received him, and he blessed her, of all things. She would sit on the floor in the library. She reads like, here's the way Jennifer reads. So don't ever stand behind her if she's reading a book. You'd be totally intimidated. <laughs> you talk about speed reading, and then there's Jennifer. <laughs> she gets saved. She sits down like a cross-legged in the library, and God gave her the, 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 a, a macro version of the kingdom through studying history. She basically got convinced and of, of revelation from God on the big picture. She's totally, right, when you did her chart, she's kingdom. I was looking at Paul. Paul did our charts. Jennifer is a kingdom person. Big picture. The micro. The macro. Then she brings it down to the micro. That's usually when it works. She's pointing it on me. First time I misbehaved on the road, Jennifer preached to me in the kitchen. She goes, dear, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. That's God's road. Those are God's people. I knew I was getting it. He places those people wherever he wants to on the road. The essence of the kingdom is love. Love is patient. Love is... See, she could annihilate me just with that. That was just in the kitchen. You imagine what she does at a church service. All right. But God took her, and her late husband was abusive. Her father was abusive to her. She's only known abuse. Her mentor both basically wrote her off as too emotionally damaged to ever amount to anything. But she, God took her, and he blessed her with revelation and insight. And then he broke her. One of the ways he broke her is she went to school. He, God made her go to school to get her graduate degrees in psychology. She was convinced that psychology was birthed by evil men. And all it is is a study of the fallen nature. And God made her go get it anyway. So... And in March, part of her brokenness was being a widow. What it was like. Single parent, you want your kid to go to school. Sometimes even Christians in the church would forget to pick her up and her little girl would be standing by the door. And I had to pray that little girl later on in life through forgiving Christians <laughs> who left her standing at the door while her mother was driving 70 miles one way as a school psychologist, 70 miles. She left when it was dark and came back and did that for years. And just the mere fact of being a widow over those years. God broke her by being married to an unsaved man that said, if you get religious, I'm going to divorce you. And she got religious anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she lived widowed as a single parent, went back to school, got her graduate degrees, and he broke her. And one day she says, I don't know if I can take this anymore. And she went down to the school of the prophets and said, I just want to get prayer. And she's no wimp, but she said, I'm really at the end. I want prayer. She went down to get prayer and they prayed over her and they said, Jennifer, the Lord's saying he will give you whatever you want. Listen to me, people. How would you answer that? God's saying, I will give you whatever you want. And she was saying, oh, just a normal Life would be nice. And then something on the inside, this is my real Jennifer. This is the tiger I marry. 
And then at the last minute before she said, just an easier life, something on the inside, am I telling it better than you would? <laughs> something on the inside would rise up in her and say, no, God, if this misery is the best you've got for me, then I'll take it. If this is all you've got for me, then so be it. I want your perfect will. That's who I married. And you know what he said? Shortly after that, 20 years ago, a lady called her and said, God's telling me to pay your way. And the one that's paying her way used to clean her house for money. She was an intercessor friend that could hear from God. She says, you're supposed to go to a conference in Jacksonville. God, I was here, didn't know anybody, and God said, go pray for those people in Jacksonville. I go, Jacksonville? I don't even know the people here. What am I going to Jacksonville for? I go to Jacksonville to this conference where we met, and you have to read that in the book. I'm not going to get into the long story. It was beautiful. But in that conference, a stranger took Jennifer and says, give me your hands and take a step forward and step into your destiny. And then we met right after that and got married eight weeks later. Step into your destiny. So was everything smooth in all these people's lives? I don't think there's, I don't think if you're looking for an exception, I think you're deceived. But I think it's more in learning that in this world you will have tribulation, but like the message says, but be of good cheer. I've removed its ability to harm you. So quit being afraid of tribulation, and instead, when there's stuff going on, well, something good must be coming, i got to respond to this right. I'm going to go the easiest way I possibly can. Jennifer basically just said three months later, that woman said, Jennifer, step forward. God is saying, step into your destiny. And to this day, Everything that I learned in the School of the Spirit, I taught Jennifer. I can't write. Jennifer could write. But like she said, until God put us together to fulfill destiny, she says, I can write books, but I would have had nothing to write. I had stuff to write, but I can't write books. Took the two together. And I believe God's doing that with a lot of married couples. And instead, you're getting sidetracked by the devil looking at your differences. What Bob Newhart used to say, the best counseling method in the world, stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Quit looking at your differences. God's basically saying this is going to be a season of convergence where I'm going to make something beautiful out of something that you think is problematic. It's how do you respond, not why. You've got to die to the why. I mean, there's times to ask why, but... Quite frankly, I've never seen anything really good produced by it. I've seen all kinds of good things saying, God, how do you want me to respond in light of the fact everything is falling apart? <laughs> and he'd usually say, forgive, repent, <laughs> and it'll be, I'll deliver you out of them all. And somehow it always turned out for the good. But here's the key. This is for everyone here. Now we're going to talk about you. God wants you to be a life message. He's going to take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. There's a journey of preparation for all of you. God prepares his workers in a school of intimacy and obedience. And for the dreamers and the visionaries, he gives one step at a time. I always like John 7:17. 7, if you do his will, you shall know. You want to go to a higher level in Revelation? If you will do his will, you will know. If you don't obey the first step, I, you're not going to have this unfolding, continuous revelation. You need obedience to the last thing he told you to do. All of life is a school. He tests your faithfulness. You know, when I got off drugs and I first got saved, had a college education and I thought I deserved, I used to manage a shoe store even in my 20s. First th place that God sent me, after I got off drugs, I'd already gotten down to welfare. He had me go and ask for a job to clean restrooms. 
and I had to go to welfare school. You know what welfare school is? They used to teach you how to fill out a job application. The line on top, you write your name. Please print. That, that was good for me, because I was saying, guess what? You know why you're here? Because you brought yourself here. You did it. You can't blame the world. The blame game's over. You did this. And it was a good kind of humiliation. I cleaned toilets in a trucking firm was the first job that God sent me to, and he sent me there three times. And I felt the joy of the Lord. Can you imagine cleaning toilets? Because it was, if this is where God wants me, then I'm going to learn this lesson really good, and I could feel the joy of the Lord. Some said it was the Clorox that maybe, <laughs> but I felt the joy of the Lord. One way or another, I felt the joy of the Lord. I worked managing a shoe store, but when I look back, God trained me the, from the business end. You know, you can't just go in ministry and be business ignorant. Worked in the factory. The factory was my school as a Christian to deal with people because I watched. I watched the men in the factory intimidate Christians until they cowered in the corner. And I'm going, I'm not going that route. So I just said, God, you're going to have to give me wisdom. And instead of wisdom, I think he gave me a sense of humor. I don't know if it was very valid. I wouldn't suggest you do these things. But they'd be, I'd be doing time studying a guy who was welding, and all of a sudden they would take a Playboy centerfold, knowing I was a Christian, and go, what do you think of that? And I'm going, is that your daughter? You shouldn't be showing pictures like that around. I was not going to do what I saw them do to the other Christians. They'd be cussing and swearing because they know Christians don't cuss and swear, so they would purposely cuss and swear more. And I'm going... All that God stuff, why don't you leave that God stuff at home? Why don't you just keep that God stuff for when you go to church? Oh, wait a minute. You, you want God to do what? Where did you learn that? I just messed with that. Everything that they used on Christians, I just went right back to them. They used God's name in vain. I go, what ex who taught you that? You want him to do what? Where? You should leave all that, all that God stuff at home, don't you think? That's what they told Christians. So, but for me, it was school. So if you're in a stinky old job, if you're the best person you can be at that stinky old job, God might get you out of that stinky old job. Do you ever think of that? Promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It's God that lifts up one, puts down another. Maybe if you responded right, you'd see some improvement. He tests your faithfulness. And the first time, and I'm still a baby Christian, I had a ministry that basically was larger than some of the churches. It was a parachurch ministry. And there was 200 couples. And God said, lay it down. It's one thing to lay it down when it's not working. Lay it down when it's really working. Of course, they go, get away, devil, get away, devil. Yeah, that, that's not God. That's not God. And God said, no, you can keep it, but that's all you'll ever have. And so I laid it down, and I had to live with the pain of that because I, you don't understand. My husband won't go to church, but he would go to your meetings. He wouldn't go to church, but he'd go to your meetings. It's, that's, that's hard to hear. But the goal of that ministry was to provoke one another to love and good deeds and get them back to church and forsake not the assembling. That was the mission. Fellowship times, dinners, social events, to get them back to church. Too many dropping out of church, and that was the emphasis. But then God basically had me break it. And when I broke it, and I died to it, God said, you see that man over there? I want you, he was a pastor of about a thousand member church. He said, I want you, without being noticed, to serve that man. I carried cement block for his building when he was building and everything. And then out of over a thousand people, one day he says, I'm going to have a practice preaching course and I want you, 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 and you. And he picked five of us. And I don't know how, by what criteria he picked five. Out of that whole congregation, I don't know. We did a practice preaching course. We did the preaching course 
The next thing you know, he turned to me and he says, I want you to preach my church Sunday. I preached his church Sunday, and when it comes from the right people, you remember this stuff really well, when it's good. He said, you can preach to the most mature person in my church. And I was just 30 years old, and that was such an honor. And he, for me, was my spiritual father because I did it without um, the opposite of what I sometimes see in the church. It's a kind of a harsh name, but I can't think of a nicer name. Opportunists. There's sons and daughters, and there's opportunists. And I can spot them a million miles away. They don't know. I often pray, God, let them see how obvious they are. Because <laughs> I don't know how else to pray for them. There's opportunists, and then there's sons and daughters. There's people that want to be mentored, but it's a two-way relationship. They want to serve, they want to receive, they want, and they want it to be mutual. And I want it to be mutual. I don't believe in a a, a one-way relationship but he took me under his wing and remember I closed the ministry that was successful and I just served him and then he it's he picked me out of the sheepfolds he took me out of the sheepfold and it took him and two well-known nationally known pastors prophets apostles who at the same time called me and because God was telling me to start a church and I'm going nope nope I laid it down I know I was called to start a church but nope I'm serving that man nope I ain't starting no church I'm serving that it took three of them to take me out to dinner and said Dennis it's time for you to start your church I mean no and then I used to listen to people say, oh, but this pastor's in my way. God's got ministry in me, but they won't let me. I'll tell you what, there's nobody going to stand in any of your ways if you're doing the purposes of God. Yeah, there's some weird people out there, including pastors. But I'll tell you what, how you respond can determine how you live the rest of your life. Huh? I was trained. I didn't know how to plant the church. You know who my first mentor was? I felt like David. David had Saul for a mentor. Come on. My first mentor did it all wrong. So when I started my first church, I said, God, I don't know how to do this. And he goes, well, you know what not to do. <laughs> so I just started with what not to do. And I did the opposite of what I saw him do. But the most important preparation was seeking God for himself alone and not seeking a ministry. And I said this statement, and this is, stole this from Reese Howell. But it got to the point where I went, and this has to be real, you can't fake this and just say it. If you feel like you're wasting away and you're not accomplishing what God called you to do, I said, if my life is wasted, it's your life to waste. If I never do another thing in ministry, if my life is totally wasted, I belong to you, Lord Jesus. It's your life to waste and do with as you please. When you can do that with honesty and sincerity in your heart, you're free. And you're not free until then. Until, until then, you need ministry more than you need Him. You will somehow shoot yourself in the foot periodically. <laughs> you will somehow sabotage God's best for you. Ministry and a title is not going to make it. Matter of fact, God proved that to me because he said, I'm sending you to the school of the spirit and I'm not letting you go to Bible school right away. I want to teach you some things. <clears throat> I was ordained for the first time in 1981 based on proven ministry. It had nothing to do with Bible school. Based on proven ministry. And to me, that means more to me than saying I went to Bible school. You can go to Bible school and not know what to do with people. Which is, that's a shock for many people coming out of Bible school and become pastors. Oh my God, they didn't teach us all these different people. It's like a soap opera. This is where the action is, people. You don't need to watch TV. All you got to do is get involved in church. There are so many interesting kinds of people, interesting kinds of scenarios that you're going to learn how to navigate around. Oh my goodness, it's an education of a lifetime. What an opportunity God's placed right before you. 
I mean, I have people say, I'm Elijah. And when there's lightning and thunder outside, he speaks to me. Okay, Elijah. Well, <laughs> isn't that exciting? And you and I get to deal with that stuff. How about the lady who, really, she's doing wonderful ministry now. If I come to this church, I'm going to destroy it. I don't think so. And Jennifer had her go for one week. I'm giving you homework for one week. You walk around for one week and say, anything that sounds unscriptural in your head, <laughs> ignore it or say, that's not me. She did. And eventually she got so healed up. She started, she helped a multitude of people from that. I had a man that was kicked out of a church. He was brought before the board, board of deacons, was removed because he was too aggressive. He was trying to override the pastor. He got kicked out and he came to my church. I'm just starting out. And I said, well, what about sharing your testimony? I know, I know your history. I know what happened. Why don't you share your testimony? First Sunday coming up. I know the pastor told me to share my testimony, but God's laid something else on my heart. I think if this church is ever going to work, he needs to radically change. What? And a lot of other people, I didn't have a lot of other people, and a lot of other people feel the same way. So I got up and I said, if you feel the same way, then you should go. I don't want to hold you back. He went, and nobody else went with him. So I don't know where all people say, you know, when they say people say, <laughs> it's usually them and their husband or wife or friend. Uh, people say, but you know what? I even had them to where we taught forgiveness so thoroughly that I had a couple ladies that say, I'm leaving this church. He's making me mad. And you know darn well if we leave, he'll, we could always come back. He'll forgive us. <laughs> well, come on, isn't that where the action is? Learn how to respond. If you're a forgiver, you've got it made. <laughs> Ministry is just the way some of the experts, I forget who said it, but they basically said all fruitfulness is birthed in intimacy with God. Who said that, gentlemen? I forgot. I forgot, but someone said all true fruitfulness in ministry is birthed out of intimacy. It's not your gifting. It's intimacy, fruitfulness. And the life of a pastor is filled with special moments, but it's mostly conducted in routine and mundane stuff. People stuff and administrative stuff. When my mother was in my first church, she had a friend it was, would come and say, oh, your son is so wonderful. She pictured that at home, at the dinner table, I would stand at a pulpit at the dinner table and preach to my family. People have all kinds of ideas of what's going on. It's strange. <laughs> and, then she, and then they used to like to go to my mother, who was in my church. They would like to go to her and say, why is your son doing that? Why is your son? And she goes, he don't tell me. The last person I would tell would be my mother. <laughs> he don't tell me nothing. I don't know what it is about that son of mine. He don't tell me nothing. And I'm going, that's for the good of the congregation, that you know nothing. <laughs> but I love you, Mom, but I'm not letting you in on the, on the leaders' meetings. The ordinary life is actually routine. And this is for I don't know who. One percent of the Christians are called to their own ministry. I'm talking what we would call full-time, 501c3, make a living totally by ministry. One percent. Ninety-nine percent are called to be ministers in everyday life. I don't know where that's happened, but all the times they would see that percentage, people change that percentage to where it's the other way around. I remember hearing young people say, Sally's going to get a job 
Isn't she afraid she's going to miss her ministry? Most of people, before you get a ministry, you better get a job to deal with people. Many are called to ministry, actually, as a part of somebody else's ministry, technically, because eventually when you mature, you want to become interdependent. Okay? So I want to close with, with a commitment for your life. Um, oh, let me throw one more free part. How many are taking notes? If you're taking notes, this will be a benefit you. All right? When I went through a real hard place in my life, God spoke to me out of Micah 7, but this is like universal. This would work for everybody. In Micah 7, verses 7, 8, and 9, just three little verses, I went through a, a um, probably a several-month period that was really full of pressure. And God used this gloriously. I actually enjoyed the journey during that time, even though it was difficult, extremely difficult. In Micah 7, he basically showed, you could call this... Uh, as I've called it in the past, a prophetic stance. You want to be a prophetic people? This is the prophetic stance. This was the stance that the prophet Micah took in difficult times. When everybody doesn't agree with you, when they don't all like you. I was so shocked when I was saved. God loved me. I figured everybody else would too. <laughs> well, was I in for a rude awakening? Anyway, the commitment... In Micah 7, or the prophetic stance was, when I fall, isn't that interesting? When I fall. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord's going to be a light to me. And God will deliver me. Here's the way I translated those during a several month difficult period in my life. This is the way the Lord spoke that portion of Scripture to me. Five elements. One, admit your failure. God can't heal excuses or blame. Admit you fail. And if you're going to be wrong, this is for men particularly, be 100% wrong. That's where they usually go. <gasps> One man raised his hand and told me, I've never been 100% wrong in my whole life. It was always, you know, but you did, you know. No, if you're going to be wrong, admit your failure, point one. Point two, and now we're still teaching this to the body of Christ, face your pain. There's no life transformation until you do like what I did. You see your foreman's face in your head, and you feel yuck in the gut because there's bitterness toward that foreman. You face that pain. You don't change this and put some prophetic pictures in there. You face that foreman's ugly face. <laughs> you feel that ugliness down here, and you release forgiveness while you see that scowling face at you. You release forgiveness here till it changes to peace. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the cross. Nothing more, nothing less. I've seen people do all kinds of goofy things. They see that foreman with that snarly face. They felt yuck in there and they go, oh, I see Jesus smiling at my foreman. I go, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> You're getting weird. He's going to smile at you if you do the work of the cross. Don't. <laughs> God wants a... The cross requires a real person and a real situation. This is not the place for prophetic visions. The prophetic visions speak of potential. I want the cross now, <laughs> not potential. I want a real person. I want you to face your pain. Admit you're wrong. Forgive. Face your pain. If you won't face the pain, it gets buried alive and it'll come out whenever it wants to. And the other thing is when you're faced the pain, the prophet had to arise. God told me, get up. You know what Christians are good at doing? When you get hit hard and you're down, you stay down. Some, of, some people, I didn't feel like going to church today. I was kind of bummed. If you can't even deal with that, 
how, what are you going to do when it gets really tough? You're going to develop such weakness of resolve. So admit your failure, face your pain, but don't wallow. Momentarily face the pain. Get rid of it quick. You only have to feel it momentarily for eternal freedom. That's a good deal. Get up, and then this is where the school of the Spirit, all of life is a school. Learn from it. What did you learn from that scenario? Because if you learn from it, you won't do it the next time, wherever you failed. You'll be prepared. You'll actually be a life lesson. Learn from it. And after you learn from it, the fifth step, do what's right from then on. So it's admit your failure, Point one. Point two, face your pain. Three, get up. Four, learn from it. That honors God when you learn from it, even from your goofy mistakes. And then fifth, prove it to God, honor God by doing it, doing what's right. He took me in a two-month period for just those five steps, and I'll tell you what, it was, the, it was I enjoyed the journey because I found out you can stay in pain very long if you wallow, right? So I want to close with praying for everyone here. How many really want a commitment to God's plan for their life? This isn't for me. This is for God to watch you, to look at your heart. I really want it. So the next time when stuff starts falling apart, when your kids aren't behaving, when things aren't doing what you want them to do, you basically say, God, how do I, not why, how do I respond? And you will watch him deliver you out of them all. Quickly. Quickly. You like quickly? Mm, I do too. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I'd like all my pastors to come up. I want to lay hands on, on them and I want to lay hands on everybody here who's going to make a fresh... I want you to come forward if you want to make a fresh commitment to your destiny. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.